assaults on sets, attacks on concerts, and the biggest festival flop that ever happened. Music may have evoked jet planes, islands, and tigers on a gold leash, but the truth of the industry looked more like sad cheese sandwiches in a disaster tent. Digital downloads were all the rage when the decade began, but the era of carefully curated iPods and MP3s was short-lived. According to the New York Times, everything changed in 2011 when Spotify launched in the United States. Now it was possible to legally stream songs using the internet, negating the need to own music at all. Other streaming services like Apple Music, Deezer, and Tidal soon followed. For Spotify, we started off being a utility to play music, and we're now becoming an experience for every moment of your life. For a relatively small monthly fee, such platforms allowed users to listen to thousands of songs using a computer or smartphone. A deal so convenient and compelling that it even convinced people to pay for music again. For the RIAA, streaming brought in 80% of the music industry's revenue by the end of 2019, saving it from the major profit losses it had experienced in the 2000s. There was just one problem. Very little of that money made it to the artists who created the music. One Spotify stream earns between .00121 cents and .00653 cents, mere fractions of pennies. To make matters worse, The Guardian notes that record labels take 50% of these earnings, the streaming platform takes 30%, and artists are left with a portion of the remaining 20%. For this reason, Taylor Swift removed her entire catalog from Spotify in late 2014, with Spotify having to break the news. The artist wrote a Wall Street Journal op-ed piece earlier that year in which she explained, "...music is art, and art is important and rare. Important, rare things are valuable. Valuable things should be paid for." I could not be more at one with nature. I do Coachella every year, so. The world-famous Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival was once a small, affordable affair. As The New Yorker notes, the idea for Coachella was inspired by a 1993 Pearl Jam show at the Empire Polo Club in Indio, California. The band played the remote location to avoid supporting venues that used Ticketmaster, demonstrating its suitability for concerts. The first Coachella was held there in October 1999. It spanned two days, hosted artists from Rage Against the Machine to Morrissey, offered free parking, then cost just $50 per day. Coachella quickly gained popularity, particularly with millennials, and throughout the 2000s, it grew to a yearly two-weekend, three-day festival attended by thousands each April. But the affordable option for $99 single-day tickets disappeared in 2010 forcing concert goers to shell out $269 plus fees for a three-day pass. By the decade's end in 2019, general admission for Coachella had soared to $429, with VIP passes available for $999. A shuttle ride from LAX to the remote location ran $75 one way. Parking and camping passes for those unable to secure limited and costly nearby hotels added an additional $125 to $325. And on-site tents ranged from $2,450 up to $9,500 for the most luxurious option. After food, drinks, and merchandise were considered, even the most frugal attendees paid thousands of dollars for one weekend. Ticketmaster has been a controversial company for decades. In 1994, Pearl Jam lodged a complaint against a ticket agency with the United States Justice Department, claiming it had intentionally hindered the band's low-cost tour. They cited its hefty add-on fees, anti-competitive practices, and monopoly over ticket sales as problematic. But Ticketmaster's power only increased. In 2010, the ticketing giant merged with the promotional company Live Nation, which managed artists and owned over 140 venues, further increasing Ticketmaster's chokehold on live music. Ticketmaster began implementing dynamic pricing for concerts in 2011 to combat scalpers. The practice causes ticket prices to change constantly to fit market demand, rather than remaining at a fixed price point, similar to airline tickets. In situations where demand is high, prices quickly become astronomical. Such was the case in 2018 when people attempted to purchase tickets for Taylor Swift's reputation tour. Swift had opted to use dynamic pricing, meaning costs of coveted seats skyrocketed before fluctuating between $595 and $995. Fans were left frustrated, often paying hundreds of dollars over perceived face value for tickets. Many individuals in the concert business observed that Ticketmaster had essentially become the ultimate scalper. Indeed, Live Nation Entertainment saw steady increases in revenue throughout the decade, peaking at $11.55 billion in 2019, with $1.54 billion of this from ticket sales. Music industry monopolies really started flexing their power in the 2010s and aren't likely to relent anytime soon. 
With its near-complete control over ticket-selling technology, venues, promotion, and major artists, the newly formed Live Nation Entertainment had tremendous power over live music. It was capable of putting rival venues out of business, charging increasingly outrageous service fees, and cutting off anyone willing to oppose its practices. Live Nation promoted over 30,000 shows, sold around 500 million tickets, and controlled over 200 venues in 2018. Similarly, only three major record labels, Sony, Universal, and Warner Music, dominated the music industry throughout the decade. They determined which artists got played on the radio, streamed, promoted, or signed at all. This control is evident in the decade's hits. 90% of the 2010's top 10 songs were by artists on major labels. Diversity plummeted, as few new songs even made it to the charts. It's the same in streaming. Two platforms, Spotify and YouTube, grew to host 75% of the world's streams. And as the next decade dawned, Spotify started leveraging its power over labels and artists to demand higher fees and royalty portions in exchange for reach. Unchecked consolidation over the 2010s has given a select few companies control over every aspect of today's music. And at the top of it all sits one billionaire, John Malone, who owns large portions of Live Nation, Pandora, Cirrus XM, and iHeartRadio, a massive swath of the music industry. With digital music and streaming now the dominant forms of music consumption, artists and labels quickly found new ways to manipulate the system in their favor. As Slate notes, it started in 2014 when Apple gifted everyone a copy of YouTube's latest album, Songs of Innocence, against their will. We've been around a while and we just wanted to do something fresh, something that no one else had done. And you know, it turns out, some people don't believe in Father Christmas. While it might have seemed harmless, Apple had essentially purchased millions of copies of the album and added it to all of its users' iTunes libraries, giving it more album sales than it likely would have had. Similar shenanigans continued throughout the decade. The music industry started measuring success in album-equivalent units in the mid-2010s to account for digital downloads and streaming. The RIAA, for example, considers 1,500 streams equal to one album sale. Some artists took this information in stride. Chris Brown's 2017 album Heartbreak on a Full Moon featured a whopping 40 songs, likely to garner more streams. Brown's tactic worked. The album reached number one on the top hip-hop R&B albums chart that year. Bundling was another effective strategy to inflate sales figures. Rapper Travis Scott racked up thousands of album sales by pairing a digital download of his 2018 album Astro World with exclusive merchandise items, like limited edition t-shirts and pre-sale codes for his upcoming shows. Desperate to collect them all, his fans bought thousands of copies of Astro World, powering it all the way to the top of the charts. Conceived by entrepreneur Billy McFarland and rapper Ja Rule, 2017's Fire Festival was supposed to be the greatest live music event of all time. The pair promised an island getaway in the Bahamas, complete with fine dining, luxurious lodging, and performances by top acts like Migos and Blink-182. Following heavy promotion on social media, namely videos peppered with models lounging on the beach, the anticipation was so great that people paid up to $49,000 for tickets. These guys are either completely full of sh or they're the smartest guys in the room. But when April 2017 rolled around, fire ticket holders were met with a very different experience. Excited festival goers arrived on the island of Great Exuma to find wet mattresses on the ground, disaster tents for lodging, and general chaos. Luggage was dispensed from a shipping container, and attendees were left to fend for themselves, with most immediately seeking the next flight off the island. Trevor DeHaas' tweet, featuring a now-iconic picture of an uninspiring cheese sandwich, served in place of the five-star catering that festival promoters had promised, concisely summarized the catastrophe. Blink-182 also took to Twitter amidst the turmoil to cancel their performances, stating that they did not think that they would have what they needed to put on good shows. Ultimately, McFarlane pleaded guilty to wire fraud in 2018 and was ordered to pay back everyone he had conned into investing in his various schemes, a sum totaling $26 million. He was also sentenced to six years in federal prison. As online platforms replaced radio and music television, artists and record labels began searching for new ways to get heard. Naturally, money talked. According to a 2022 study published in the UC Irvine Law Review, labels could pay for ads, which got songs played with higher frequency. But they could also petition Spotify editors to add their artist songs to curated playlists streamed by millions, or pay third-party companies like Playlist Push to locate and pitch songs to popular playlist curators or influencers. Hey, let me know if you need a Spotify playlist. A successful playlister campaign typically costs about $500 to $1,500 per song. To ensure the job gets done, Playlist Push often pays up to $12 for the song's consideration or addition to a playlist. 
TikTok campaigns are a little cheaper. $300 gets a song added to a list that influencers can choose from. If the song is used in a TikTok video, Playlist Push pays the influencer $10. But Spotify's new promotional tool, Marquee, comes even closer to Payola. Launched in 2019, Marquee presents pop-up ads that remind users of new songs and albums on their release day. Spotify requests a minimum of $5,000 per such campaign, charging $0.55 cents every time a user clicks on a pop-up. In exchange, it promises over 9,000 new listeners per week. Like Radio Payola, the system favors the already wealthy, which tend to be mainstream artists and major labels. But unlike radio stations, online platforms do not fall under the FCC's jurisdiction and remain unregulated. In a 2018 press release, Universal Music Group announced that country singer-songwriter-turned-pop megastar Taylor Swift had signed a multi-album deal with UMG, the world's biggest label. Of course, this also meant that she had left her original indie label, Big Machine Records, behind. A teenage Swift signed with Big Machine in 2005. She released her first six albums on the label, including 2012's Red, 2014's 1989, and 2017's Reputation. Shortly after Swift's departure, Big Machine Records, along with all of Swift's masters, was sold to Ithaca Holdings, a company owned by Swift's longtime rival Scooter Braun. Swift took to Tumblr to express her disappointment in 2019, writing, For years I asked, pleaded for a chance to own my own work. Instead, I was given an opportunity to sign back up to Big Machine Records. I had to make the excruciating choice to leave behind my past. Swift claims that Big Machine's founder Scott Borchetta sold her masters to Braun out of spite, although Borchetta denies this. In a blog post on Big Machine Label Group's website, he claims that Swift had willingly surrendered her masters. Nevertheless, Swift set to work re-recording her first six albums, encouraging her fans to purchase and stream Taylor's versions of her songs to reclaim rights and ensure that royalties did not end up benefiting Braun. As she wrote on Tumblr, you deserve to own the art you make. Popular music became more formulaic than ever in the 2010s. For starters, Quartz notes that songs lost about 20 seconds from 2013 to 2018, with 6% of 2018's hit songs coming in at 2 minutes and 30 seconds or less. This is likely the fault of streaming. Since artists earn money for complete streams and the pay rate for every song is the same regardless of length, shorter songs allow artists to rack up more streams and therefore maximize profits. It's all about clicks now. I got a streaming farm going here. This monetary incentive affected everyone one from rapper Kanye West to country singer Jason Aldean, and indeed both artists released increasingly shorter songs over the decade. In addition, most of the top-charting songs in the 2010s were actually written by the same handful of people. Swedish record producer Max Martin wrote 16 of the decade's Billboard Hot 100 number 1 songs, including Katy Perry's California Girls, Pink's Raise Your Glass, Taylor Swift's Shake It Off, and The Weeknd's Can't Feel My Face. One Republic's Ryan Tedder also wrote quite a few of the 2010s' biggest hits, including Adele's Rumor Has It and Ellie Gold Goldings Burn, and pop star Sia had a hand in the behind-the-scenes hit-making as well, writing Beyoncé's Pretty Hurts and Rihanna's Diamonds, among many others. All of this culminated in a decade of songs that sounded eerily similar. The 2010s saw several horrific attacks on concertgoers. On November 13, 2015, three men entered the Bataclan Theater in Paris, France, during an Eagles of Death Metal show and fired on the 1,500-person crowd with assault rifles. Ninety people were killed, and many others were injured. Several concertgoers managed to escape through a side exit. A few climbed onto the roof, and others lay on the ground. The shooting, part of an organized citywide attack, ended with the three perpetrators being shot or exploding suicide belts. Tragedy struck again a few years later. Erratic radicalized suicide bomber detonated himself immediately following an Ariana Grande concert at England's Manchester Arena on May 22, 2017, killing 22 concertgoers and injuring 116 more. On October 1st that same year, a lone gunman fired into the crowd of Las Vegas's Route 91 Country Music Festival from his adjacent hotel room, killing 58 and injuring over 500. The devastating attacks have impacted live music enthusiasts the world over. According to a 2015 survey by Spingo, one in three Americans felt concerned for their safety while attending live music events following the Paris attack, and over half of those surveyed expressed a need for increased concert security. As research firm Ovum's Simon Dyson told CNBC, such security measures will likely further increase increase ticket prices as venues, promoters, and artists reallocate their resources. In 2013, Robin Thicke, T.I., and Pharrell Williams' party anthem Blurred Lines completely took over the airwaves. The catchy song led the Billboard Hot 100 chart for 12 straight weeks, received several Grammy nominations, and was later certified Diamond, making it one of the most successful songs of the decade. But not everyone was a fan. Almost immediately, the song drew controversy for its problematic lyrics, which included the lines, I know you want it, and I hate these blurred lines. As The Guardian notes, several UK universities banned the song, claiming it objectified women, disregarded the need 
begged for consent and even promoted sexual assault. The song's misogynistic music video didn't help. The unrated version, which featured Thick, Williams, and T.I., all fully clothed, surrounded by topless models, was initially banned by YouTube. As it turned out, life imitated art. In her 2021 book My Body, model and actor Emily Ratajkowski claimed that Thick groped her breasts during the video's filming, stating that the incident humiliated her and made her feel, quote, naked for the first time that day. Thick and Williams were also accused of copyright infringement. Marvin Gaye's family claimed that Blurred Lines was remarkably similar to Gaye's 1977 hit Gotta Give It Up. This led to a five-year legal battle, which ultimately culminated in Thick and Williams paying Gaye's family around $5 million in 2018. Female artists continued to navigate misogyny in the music industry in the 2010s. Perhaps the decade's most famous instance of such injustice was pop star Kesha's long battle with her producer Dr. Luke. Kesha had entered into a six-album deal with Luke in 2005 when she was only 18. The two released her 2010 album Animal, which featured her breakout song TikTok together. Music superstar Kesha and the damning allegations that she is leveled against one of the music business's biggest producers. In 2014, Kesha filed a lawsuit against Luke, claiming that he had bullied her about her weight, was consistently emotionally abusive, and had threatened to ruin her career if she didn't comply with him. She also claimed that in 2005, Luke drugged her at a party and took her back to his hotel room, where he sexually assaulted her while she was unconscious. Luke countersued for defamation. In 2016, a judge denied a preliminary injunction that would have released Kesha from her contract, leaving her in tears. Her mother, P.B. Siebert, told Billboard, Dr. Luke basically owns Kesha until her death. He doesn't have to give her any money and is under no time constraints. She can't legally put any new music out, or he can and will sue her. Other female artists, including Adele, Lady Gaga, and Kelly Clarkson, rallied behind Kesha. Taylor Swift even sent her $250,000 to assist with legal fees. Swift had fought her own legal battle against sexual abuse when a radio DJ groped her at a meet-and-greet in 2013, then sued her for losing his job. Swift successfully countersued for $1. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact RAIN's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE-4673.